Let's open our Bibles to Acts 17. We're going to look at God's stones of remembrance, and I'm going to take you through quite a few verses and actually uh, use the backdrop of this historic event to teach each one of us a lesson that the Apostle Paul was so desperately seeking by God's Spirit's power to teach to those dear folks. We're going to go tonight looking at the stones of God's witness, that's the ruins in the ancient world, which testify to the verses specifically in Acts 17. We're going to go from the city of Athens to Corinth. Remember, these places in the Bible are real places. In fact, every spot that's mentioned in the book of Acts, they have found traces of to prove they're there. Those events really happened, and they happened to real people. And those real people that we find written about here were in a real place that we're going to see tonight, and they had real problems that God solved, and those are the message for us today. Main Street Christianity, Paul and the early church went and spoke to where people were, and you're going to see how relevant this is as we track through these verses. Remember, we went to Philippi and we learned three lessons. God uh, told them that they were citizens of heaven everywhere they were. And the way you live as a citizen of heaven is you have the mind of Christ, which is, of course, fed and nurtured by the Spirit. And that leads us to, no matter what goes on in life, to praise God even from the pits of life. Then we went to Thessalonica a few uh, weeks later and we watched for Christ from the trenches. Those people were learning what it meant to be a memtas, that is, blamelessly living out in that culture. Then we stopped for just a little while in Berea, and that's the, where we get into the 17th chapter. Look at verse 11, and if you've never marked this, this is the verse that you should just bring up before your mind every time you hear someone speak on the radio, on a tape, uh, on television, at church. You ought to say, uh, I want to check what the Bible says against what they say. We should all be Acts 17, 11 Christians. It would strengthen us. Do not take something for granted just because it's printed, even if it's printed in your study Bible. You should examine the scriptures. You have and I have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and we can know all things, and God will illumine our hearts. Now we're going to Athens, and we're going to start in the 16th verse of uh, Acts 17, and we're going to learn about how to know the true God. Athens in Paul's day had 10,000 people and 30,000 actual idols on little stands and carved into the stone. Now, Socrates once quipped, I didn't hear him, but it's recorded in history, it was easier to run into a god than into a man in the city of Athens because of this three-for-one ratio. But Paul, starting in verse 16, to confront this culture, studied this culture, and saw that the overarching 10,000 people town with 30,000 idols meant that you had to approach them through identifying them with this God thing that they were into. And so uh, he saw they were searching for something. And so as he walked around, he saw that there were three main, now there were 30,000 gods, but there were three main ones that that seemed to be elevated, especially up there in that Parthenon, uh, where at the top there uh, of, of the Acropolis, remember Acropolis, the high city, and it has its top blown off during the uh, uh, Turkish-Russian War, but uh, it was beautiful for centuries. The three gods were Athena, the mother of wisdom. And as I read through these, think they're the same gods we have today. Now, we aren't building monuments like this, and you don't see stuff like that, you know, uh, other than, you know, in, in Washington, but they're not to false gods. They're, but in a way, they are, if you think about these gods. Number one, Athena was the mother of wisdom. How we've elevated learning and schooling. In fact, we think if someone has a bunch of degrees and if they and if we go off to listen to them in school and if they cast aspersions on the God of our father and mother, we think that they must know more than we do and they must be wiser and so many young people abandon their faith because of the God of wisdom, because the culture educated people with degrees after they believe that. Well, they believed in the mother of wisdom, Athena. Then Demeter is the mother of earth and how present that is. We have a lot of earth worshipers today. I don't just mean the ecology type. I'm talking about people that, that they live and worship this earth. They, they say, this world is my home. I'm not just passing through. My treasures are laid up here. And so we have a lot of earth worship. And then Zeus, the third of the key gods of the ancient culture. He was the father of power or force. And don't we respect people that are powerful and forceful, and the pushers and the movers? And so he examined that and prepared his message. And look at verse 16, the second part. It says, uh, while he was waiting there in Athens with these 30,000 idols around, it says his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to wisdom, the earth, and power, these these 
idols. He was provoked. Next we see that uh, he said the city was given over these idols. This is the only uh, model we have of the Athena, the wisdom statue that used to be in the Parthenon. And he saw many. This is what their idols would have looked like, uh, this representation here. Continuing, uh, what a sight it must have been. This is what it looks like today. This is the Odeon, the concert hall, which is down at the foot of the Acropolis. And then you see all the various buildings up there at the top uh, during the sound and light show that goes on in Athens. But Athens was a a moving experience to go to, and, and Paul accepted that and approached the people on that plane. This is the great temple to the power god, Zeus, uh, at night. Uh, this is just a, a little fraction of what was there with the beautiful columns and with all the priestesses and with all the sacrifices and with all the gold. It was quite a sight. This is all that's left today. But if you notice, look at uh, verse 17, the next verse. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshipers, But, look at this, I I love this, in the middle of verse 17, and in the marketplace daily with those who happen to be there. It's interesting, the word marketplace right there is the the word agora, or the forum. And so he went, and this archway you see with the four columns and the the beautiful top there is, is the entrance to the forum area. And so we know that through these columns, this main entrance, Paul would, would regularly walk in in order to dialogue with these people. The uh, next part of uh, verse 17 says this, with those who happen to be there, uh, the the stoa, which you see this long building has been reconstructed, this is what all the buildings would have looked like, what you see up there with the nice clay rooftop, uh, uh, those clay tiles and all those columns. Those people happened to be there because there were the Epicureans and the Stoics and and all the the various followers of these various gods. And so Paul, uh, it says in verse 18, would listen to these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who would come into him in the marketplace. See, they would leave this long um, lecture hall that you see in front of you and go out where the trees are into the, the forum area, and Paul would speak with them about the Lord. Verse 19 introduces probably the best-known part of Athens to us. It says, uh, and they took, in Acts 17, 19, him, Paul, and brought him to the Areopagus, or Areopagus. By the way, that, that's still the name of the Supreme Court of uh, Greece. In fact, that's where Socrates was tried and given the bitter hemlock and had to be uh, killed. He was executed because of uh, the Areopagus, the Mars Hill, the, the Supreme Court. It's interesting that this word from Acts 17, 19 is carried right into Greek culture, and instead of, as we call our uh, highest judicial branch, the Supreme Court, they call it the Areopagus. And they, they brought him there, as it were, on trial, but not for his life, and they were trying him because he had a new idea they'd never heard of. On Mars Hill. This is what Mars Hill looks like up close, the, the center outcropping of rock. You can see the cedar trees uh, growing up around it. On the left is uh, where you approach it with a carved in uh, little stairway. But Paul communicated through finding common ground in the culture of those he sought to win. Starting in verse 22, you can see that. And if you want to know someone from, from our culture that seems to have gotten that knack, it's, it's the, the current. Uh, great-selling author, uh, Ravi Zacharias. He, he has analyzed so deeply our culture that he writes his books and, and speaks in the words of the culture to our culture. And so, listen in verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the uh, Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things you're very religious. For as I was passing by and through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. Remember, there was Demeter, and there was Zeus, and there was Athena. But he says, hey, this one said, to the unknown God. Now, now this key line, that, that was the ultimate, perfect, culturally relevant entrance into their lives. He, he stepped in through that door. And look at verse 23. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. What a great entree. Well, verse 24 This is how he reveals on this spot. And that's what I love. Uh, This book really happened, and all the things that are recorded in it really happened in real places. And, I mean, right there, where those cedar trees around that big rock, this is what Paul says in verse 24. 
He said, God who made the world and everything in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He said, the real God doesn't live in these temples that you have built. Verse 27, this is what he continues to tell them. He says, God has done all this that you should seek the Lord in the hope that you might grope for him and find him because he's not far from each one of us. He wanted them to know the true God. And, and I ask this question, are we confidently knowing and walking with God so we can declare his truth? Are we so utterly convinced that we can look people right in the eye as they're staring death in the face or they're staring at their own physical downfall with their health or, or as they're, they're facing financial ruin or they've just tried every avenue of pleasure and they've exhausted every one of them? Can we look them right in the eye with confidence and say, I know the living and true God and I would like to introduce you to him. That's how confidently Paul spoke on this place. Well, verse 31, I love this, and I want you to, if you've never marked this in your Bible, it's a great thing to have. He said some points to them which which constitute a way we can confront people. In fact, I remember the first time I ever preached on verse 31, I was at Zuma Beach in, in Los Angeles. It's one of the most great, I mean, if you ever want to have a, an awesome place to preach, go to Zuma Beach. You can stand on a rock, and the whole time you're preaching, the waves hit it, and they shoot straight up like this. Right behind you. I mean, it's just, I mean, everybody has their eyes glued on you, whether you're a good preacher or not. It's so loud, they can't really hear what you're saying anyway. But I remember preaching, uh, floodlights on me, and the whole youth group of Grace Community, I think there were about 600 there, and the, the water was going, and they couldn't hear it. I'll tell you what I told them, because they didn't get to hear it that night. The water was too loud. What did Paul tell them? Verse 31. He says, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to all this by raising him from the dead. He had a three-point sermon. Let's look at the three points. Number one, verse 31, the beginning. They each faced an inescapable day. We need to tell people that we know we are approaching an inescapable day. We can't get out of it. We have an appointment. We can't avoid it. We can't be late or call in sick, or have our car break down. We have an inescapable day. We're going to meet God. Secondly, they would each answer to an unchallengeable judge. What do I mean by that? I mean a judge that won't say, oh, we'll throw this case out. Oh, you know, there was a wrongful whatever in the evidence. No, no. The the scriptures tell us that God is going to play back all of our words and deeds unless they've been erased by the blood of Christ. Wow. Wow. There's there's not going to be any, I didn't do that. It's just going to be a this was your life with God's supernatural recording system of every thought playing through with every word and every deed. And it's all going to be just totally manifested. It's an unchallengeable judge. In fact, the scriptures say that people at the great white throne are silent before God. They acknowledge. In fact, they glorify him too late because he by their silence they're accepting what he says now think about that an inescapable day and by the way we also have an inescapable day we'll see at corinth but part of the the compulsion we have to witness to the lost is you have an inescapable day and everything you've ever said thought done every single bit of it is going to be not in digital video it's going to be in surround uh hologram it's going to be reenacted before you're going to see it and everything, every every sin that's going to cling to you for eternity is going to be right there, an unchallengeable judge. Last point in verse 31. All this, he said, is based on this. At the end of verse 31, he said, He has assured us this by raising him from the dead. It's an indisputable fact. Witness to 500 people witness the risen Christ. I mean, there are more witnesses that Christ rose than there are that that Julius Caesar ever existed, or you could go through any event in history. And so he, he builds his gospel message on this, this inescapable day and this unchallengeable judge and this indisputable fact that Jesus Christ truly rose from the dead. And even our calendar is based on that. Well, after that, look at chapter 18, verse 1. You, you know the story that some clung to him and most didn't. But he leaves Athens and goes to Corinth, and that's where we're going to go next. Uh, and we're going to look at how to please God with my life. And to understand Corinth, if you turn fast forward to 1 Corinthians 4.1, I want to show you, and if you want to flip over there in your Bible, Paul went to Corinth, but when you get to Corinth, the way you get to Corinth from Athens is that you would, would go and sail around on a boat, or you'd go overland, but the great 
part of the Corinthian uh, draw was that it was the most thriving seaport of the ancient world. It was world famous. Now, this is the Corinthian Canal looking from the east. Uh, the bridge over the top is where the modern roadway is. The buses and the trains go over that. This is where modern-day boats go, but this follows the same track as over on the right. You can see on the right there, there's a road. Between the road and this canal is an old, ancient Roman tramway. It was called the Diolcos. It was the, the place where, I've told you many times, they would take the boats and get them on the Aegean seaside and pull them out of the water, put them on rolling logs, and the, the uh, slaves would pull the boat across the tramway, which in Greek is Diolkos, and drop them in the Tyranian Sea, which is between Greece and Italy. And so they'd come on the, on the Greek side, and in this very narrow isthmus, it was uh, at the widest about 600 yards. It's about 1,800 feet in the narrowest part, and they could just go over the top and, and pull these boats. And while they were pulling them, you would be sitting in Corinth, and all you'd see all day long were these huge three-decked boats with their, their center staff and all the accoutrements of the Roman Empire being dragged by. And so that's the backdrop of, look at verse 1 of chapter 4. This is what Paul says. Let a man so consider me as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. This is the great word huperetes, servants. The Greek word is huper, which means under, uh, and retes, which means rowers of Christ. Now the question for us is, how do I please the Lord? The whole book of, of uh, to the Corinthians is all about how to please the Lord. We get we get all caught up in the, the the tongues part and the lawsuit part and the divorce part. But step back, Paul was not actually writing merely to to hit all those issues. Think of the big picture. The whole book of First Corinthians is all about how to please the Lord. And how do you please the Lord? Well, first of all, in chapter four, verse one, which is probably one of the great themes. By being a servant of Christ. How were you a servant of Christ? Five things that we've learned about this. And with that, Dialkos in the background and that canal. Remember they had the road to the captain's beat? You please God with a submissive life. By the way, a submissive person is usually a humble person, and a proud person is an unsubmissive person. And so if you are a submissive person, you are characterized by humility, and, and there is some a quality in your life, a submissive life. If you are a proud person, you don't submit to anybody or anything. You just run the show. And so a pleasing God, bondservant life, is a submissive life. They had to row together on those boats. That's a sensitive life. They had to trust the captain. They didn't know where they were. That's a trusting life. They were chained to the boat. That's a dedicated life. And they were never seen if they were doing their job. That's a humble life. And that's the lesson that Paul gave them from this spot. Well, by living six simple areas, Paul wrote them about they could please the Lord. Now, I wonder, are you practicing these lessons? If we took the whole book of 1 Corinthians and divided it into what it's about, the first chapter is we should avoid all spiritual rivalry. Do you know what ruins the church? Spiritual rivalry. People are trying to build their own little group, and they're, they're, they're trying to get loyalties, and, and, and that's what the whole first chapter is. Avoid spiritual rivalry. Don't, don't feed that. Secondly, the second chapter is pursue spiritual wisdom. The opposite of rivalry is to operate in the realm of wisdom. So 1 Corinthians 2 is all about how to pursue spiritual wisdom and, and let the Spirit of God illumine our hearts. The third and fourth chapter are earn spiritual rewards. We should be consumed with what won't burn up. And so if you want to know what's not going to burn up, the third and fourth chapter is all about that. And the, uh, the theme of it is what we just saw in verse 1 about being a bondservant. And then... The 5th through the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians is all about how to have a spiritual response. How to have a spiritual response to immorality. That's chapter 5. Chapter 6, how to have a spiritual response toward lawsuits. Chapter 7, toward marital problems. Chapter 8, toward questionable things. You can just go through each of these chapters. And he tells him what the spiritual response should be. Then, the next section talks about how to use your spiritual gifts. You should know them and use them for the glory of God, either speaking or serving. And finally, how to live in spiritual hope. And do we practice these lessons? Well, Paul then takes them in the next slide to remind them of something. And that is uh, he, all the way through in Romans 16 and 2 Timothy 4, identifies faithful everyday Christians. And, and this, E-R-A-S-T-U-S, that is just a quick shot down of one of the paving stones. And then, of course, the great Roman Empire um, uh, code there, the S P. 
uh, SQ deal. But this guy, Erastus, is mentioned twice in Romans 16 and 2 Timothy 4. He was an everyday Christian in the city of Corinth. And what I thought, another thing that pleases God is faithful witnesses in the workplace please the Lord. This guy was a believer, and he lived in Corinth. He was actually the public works director, and that's his name. And, and just like in the sidewalks, if you walk around Tulsa, you'll see a stamp by who made him. Well, they used to stamp who under whose administration the public works was done. And this guy came to Christ, and he remained faithful to Christ to the end of Paul's life. In 2 Timothy 4, he's still faithful. And this man is an example of something that pleases the Lord. He was a witness right where he worked every day. He was a witness not only in the church, but, but he was a man whose life stood out in the marketplace of life, in, in the business world. And that's something that pleases the Lord, which is still in the street stones. Uh, another thing that pleases the Lord is hard work. If you see here uh, in Acts 18.3, it says he stayed and worked as a tent maker. Um, if you're back in the book of Acts, chapter 18, verse 3, he, Paul wasn't afraid of hard work. In fact, he told the people, uh, be quiet, mind your own business, and work. He believed in it. He, he worked for an income. He worked, and hard work pleases the Lord. And that's something we should think about in our culture where hard work is almost a curse. Then I always think of this, the lurid shadows of Corinth's temples were across that whole town. And Paul says to them in 1 Corinthians 6, 1, flee sexual immorality. And something else that pleases the Lord is purity of mind and body. That pleases the Lord, and that's a theme of this book. And then the last, and this is where we'll pick up next time, this is where Paul introduces us to the Bema seat, the judgment, the Bema. This is the Bema of Corinth. And I've sat there uh, and reflected many times with groups, and, and I remember the last time I was there, people from Tulsa Bible Church sat on those stones, and as we read the scriptures, I saw tears running down their faces because they were reliving on that moment what it's going to be like when we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And there it will matter if we please the Lord. You know, you can get by now by pleasing or not pleasing him. I mean, nobody really is keeping track. We can fake it and kind of go with the flow. But there, all the fluff will be gone, all the smoke will be blown away, and all the mirrors will be absent. And just what we were in the power of the Spirit of God, for the glory of God, and how much of our life we redeem for eternity by sacrificially consecrating it back to God. And that's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. How much of your life and my life have we given back?